Okay, so welcome to the UNCG Libraries Research and Application Webinar Series. My name is Sam Harlow. I'm the online learning librarian. We came up with this series, two series of webinars um, years ago now. Um, one on the research and application, which are anything to do with research, uh, usually hosted by librarians here at UNCG. Um, so today, Erin Larmore, our university archivist, is going to be talking about oral history metadata synchronizer, otherwise known as, you say, OHMS? Yes, OHMS. OHMS. It's the worst name for a, a helpful tool. Yes, I, so <laughs> very helpful. So that's what we're here to talk about today. So just a couple of logistical things before Erin takes over. Um, this, we are in Zoom meetings, so um, probably at this point, you know, uh, well into a pandemic. We're all pretty familiar, but just a couple of reminders. Erin um, is going to be hosting this and sharing her screen and be doing it in demo mode. But if you have any questions throughout, um, it's probably best to try to keep yourself muted and use the chat and I'll monitor the chat. If you, Erin has said that if you have stuff where if she's demoing something and you want to address something um, quickly, you are welcome to unmute. This is a more casual presentation. Um, so Aaron has said that is okay. Um, if you do not have a microphone, that's totally fine. You can use the chat to communicate and I will communicate with Aaron for you. These are around 30 minutes. Aaron has um, left enough room for questions um, in here as well, um, but these are also recorded. So um, note that we will be providing you with the recording a couple of days after the fact. It will be on YouTube and it will be closed captioned, but participant data will be hidden within the YouTube version. Um, I think that's about it with the logistical stuff. Um, if you have any questions about like how this is going to run, feel free to let me know in the chat. I'm also going to drop my email on the chat and where these webinars live, but you will get an email reminder with all this stuff as well. Um, so if you have any technical issues, like you can't, all of a sudden your sound goes out, your internet goes out, again, don't panic. We are recording, but you're also welcome to email me. Um, directly, I leave my email up during these and I'll address, uh, I'll help you, I'll try to help you on the kind of back end. So without further ado, here is Erin, again, the UNCG University Archivist, and uh, she is going to take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm here to talk about the oral history metadata synchronizer. It, as I mentioned a second ago, it has a terrible name. Uh, it's a very boring name that is very descriptive of what it does, but it does go by the acronym of OMS. Um, so when I'm going to talk about OMS and not actually say oral history metadata, metadata synchronizer, which I can barely say in the first place, um, repeatedly. So to start out with, what, what is OMS? Um, I'm not sure how many of you have kind of looked into what this is. I'm not sure how many of you already kind of know what it does, but OMS is essentially a tool that enhances access to audio and video recordings. It's primarily created for traditional oral history interviews, but it's been widely used for um, indexing uh, documentary films, uh, long films that need to kind of be broken into chapters. That's how I often think about it is it's a tool that allows you to essentially create a table of contents really easily um, for audio or video. And it's, as we'll see in a bit, it's audio or video that you could have hosted on YouTube, you could have it hosted on SoundCloud, um, or you could have it hosted on your own server. It also allows you to sync transcripts. So if you have transcripts for your audio or video, you can actually um, sync it up. And essentially all of this works so that your user, you know, I mentioned it's traditionally for a traditional oral history interviews. Oral history interviews can be two or more hours long. They, they can be a lot to deal with if you're only looking for one specific um, topic. And so what OMS allows you to do is to give the user, give your researcher, give whoever's viewing your video an opportunity to skip to the relevant parts without having to read an entire, you know, 25, 30 page transcript, make a guess on keywords to kind of hop to the right part of the transcript or listen to a two hour file. I will say OMS is also, uh, as we'll see, the back end at least is a web-based tool. 
it doesn't require you to download any kind of special uh, tool in order to kind of work the back end, but it does have a viewer that you would have to install somewhere. And again, we'll talk about that in a second. And it is open source. So there's constant revisions being done. You can actually get the code and um, if, if you're so inclined, play around with it and make it work for you. So I want to actually, and I this will operate. Can you see, are you seeing Leah Wong Ashburn now? Now we are. Yes. Awesome. So there is a slight delay. That is good to know. Um, so this is what OMS looks like inside of our um, content management system at UNCG. The content management system, which is where we keep all of our digital um, collections, is kind of the giant wrapper that you see around everything. Ohms is technically this gray box, just this gray box. And what you'll see when you look at it is that it's pulling this video from YouTube. So if I were to press play, you can actually see kind of, it looks like embedding a YouTube video into, you know, any kind of website. So our video itself lives on YouTube. The element that we'll see in a second wraps it all together. And it allows us to, again, chunk it into um, chapters. So if your only interest in this was listening to Leah talk about the production size at Highland Brewing Company in Asheville, you can actually click there, skip directly to that segment, or even link directly to that segment using um, the OMS tool. And I mentioned that it does this with the transcript too. So you can skip over to search the transcript for a keyword and then click the time code to skip to that. That relevant. So my dog is yelling at us. Um, OMS essentially has two parts, as I've mentioned, the viewer, which is what we see here. This is what the public sees this is what's the application that's in the background and that's what you see here so if you're interested in using ohms you can request as part of their Louis B. Nunn Center for Oral History and the University of Kentucky hosts the tool that's the application where you a professor, for instance, teaching a class and your class as a whole will be using OMS, you can request basically an institutional account for any of you are a, a researcher who has their own batch of interviews. You can also select personal from the type of OMS account requested drop down box. Kentucky, I'll be honest, is usually really fast about setting all of this up. Um, I've never heard of it taking more than maybe three or four days. It does um, rely on one or two people to process the applications for new accounts. So if those two people were to happen to be on vacation at the same time, it's usually pretty quick. Once you get your account and you log in, you'll have a page that looks somewhat like this. I have a repository manager tab because I manage the repository would be the personal manager there too. So basically what it does is it allows you to create metadata, so information of chunking of the video. If you have a transcript, it allows you to upload a transcript. It does require you to upload a text file, so a basic .txt file, um, which you can create from a doc file very easily. Just go to save as and it'll strip out all the special characters that Word kind of has hiding in the background. And then you can sync the interview, which is again where you're um, putting in those time codes. Um, and I'll show you in a second how 
how that works. There's also a notes field, which is for you as the account manager, just to add whatever notes that you need in order to kind of figure out what this interview is and, and what it looks like. So as you can see, we have a ton of interviews that we have uh, included in our account. I have a test file. I'm gonna go ahead and open that test file up just to kind of show you and walk you through some of the options that are in OMS. Um, and I'll talk a little bit at the end about resources that are available for, for learning more details, for asking questions from the OMS community. That's one of the joys of open source is there is an OMS community. So clicking over to the metadata, I've actually just picked a video um, that we already had on our YouTube channel and um, synced up the, the transcript. So I'm not gonna kind of show you how to get the video off, you know, the link off of YouTube. It's, you just basically select YouTube as your media host and put the URL in. Like I said, there are a number of other options. Um, if, if it's audio only, you could go to SoundCloud, um, you could use Vimeo, whatever you're using, um, chances are that it'll work with ohms. And I'll be honest, if it doesn't already work with ohms, chances are they're working on making it work with ohms. And so that's another thing where you can kind of go to the community and ask questions. So this metadata editor is about all the, all the information you have about the interview or about the, the, audio, the video or audio file. Like I said, it's primarily written for oral history. So some of the fields, almost all of which are optional, um, may not be applicable depending on what kind of interview, uh, what kind of file you're looking at. For instance, you may not want to have interviewee or interviewer if it's just a video. Um, you may not have a, an exact date depending on what it is, but um, these are all options that you can include. And all of this information, once we're done, gets pushed out with an XML file that you can then ingest into your content management system. One of the things that I like that OMS also has is the dashboard, which we'll go back to in a second, is color coded. So if, if assuming you have the ability to see the full stream, of, the full range of colors, if we choose that this is a um, file that's ready for QC, ready for quality control. Say I've inputted, I've, I've put in all of my information. I'm ready for the next person to just check it and make sure it's okay. This is a great thing if you have students who are inputting the metadata, or honestly, if you just have a partner on the project who um, needs to check to make sure that you haven't mistyped anything. It's a useful thing to have. So I'm gonna say that this is ready for QC and hit save. So it'll take us back to the platform, to the main platform, and you'll see that the word metadata changed colors. It started off as a black box like this one. It's now changed to red. So if I am the person who's going in to do quality control work, I can just visually look through everything and see what's red, and that tells me what needs quality control. What do I need to check? Um, Similarly, if it's green, that means go. I can look at this, see that Anita's interview is green, the metadata is complete. I don't need to do anything else. Um, index, again, is where we're putting in the, the chapters. So it takes you to a page that looks very scary and empty as of right now. But you can see that it automatically pulls up the video file from YouTube. I can press play for some reason, it's not starting at the beginning. I'll press play and have it start at the beginning. And when I'm ready to say chapter one, so for instance, I'm gonna say that the first chapter in this interview is the introduction. I click tag now and slowly, because this is because of my internet, not because of the tool. Um, I've been having some problems all morning with slow internet access. It will bring up a, um, a tag option where I can enter metadata about this first initial tag. And it does not seem to want to do that. So what I'm gonna do instead is go back to the main file and instead of playing around with my new thing, we're gonna be using Anita as our um, tester. You can see that it actually will 
what you're tagging, what you hit when you get tag data looks like this. And you can add as much or as little information as you'd like. So I'm saying this is the introductory interview introduction. Today is June 25th is the very first part of the transcript. It's the first few words that are being spoken in the video. You could add keywords, you can add subjects, you can add a brief segment synopsis. You can even add GPS coordinates. Now for interviews, most of our interviews that we have here don't require something like GPS coordinates because people aren't specifically talking about a particular place or a particular space. Um, but the University of Kentucky, for instance, has a large interview segment that they use OMS for with um, military veterans. And when military veterans are talking about Fallujah, serving in Fallujah, you can actually add the GPS locations for the place where they're speaking about, and it will include in the metadata a link out to um, a Google map of Fallujah. Similarly for hyperlinks, if they talk about a website or if you have photographs of this person doing the thing they're talking about in their interview, you can add that link, link out to that and provide additional context around the interview. You also, again, can sync the interview. And this is the, honestly, the easiest part of everything. So when I click sync, it asks, how, how synced do you want it? We usually go with one minute, which means that every minute you have the option of skipping to a new segment. So again, when you chase the transcript, when you're checking for a certain keyword, you don't have to listen to 10 minutes. You only have to listen to one minute and you can um, skip around. So to sync the interview, we'll hear in a second, hopefully, a ding. I'll skip to one. There, we'll just skip to it. Okay, once again, my internet is not cooperating. What it will do is at the, when I'm saying every minute, I want to be able to mark on the transcript where that minute mark is, it will actually make a dinging sound, very high pitched, unmissable dinging sound at the 50 second mark. So if I'm going to make a, a if it's, if I wanna say this is the one minute mark at the 50 second mark, it will ding and then 10 seconds later, it dings again. When you get the second ding, you basically just click on the word in the transcript. And you can see there that it actually inputs the one minute mark on the word R. And so that way we know where each one of these marks are as you go down the interview. And it allows you to do that and skip relatively easily. So it, you only have to listen to those 10 seconds, the 50 second to the one minute mark. And again, you can mark this as when you're done, ready for QC, return to the interviews, and it has, um, it will change colors again on the dashboard. And then once you have everything done, again, if everything is green, everything is ready to go, you can export out the file as either XML or CSV. And I kind of want to show you what you know, I know that not everyone has the content management system that we have. What we do have and what you can use easily, which I can't really kind of get into in 30 minutes, is another tool called Omeka, which is an online exhibit tool. Um, it's another open source tool that's free. The library provides support for uh, faculty members who are using this in research. You can actually embed OMS really easily in Omeka so that you can create a very basic online display of all of the interviews that you have. You can see here a list of interviews with women in the North Carolina brewing industry. When I click on one, it pulls up the full OMS file. Again, pulls it from YouTube. You see all of this information, all of the chapters. 
you can search the transcript, you can skip to the two minute mark, you can even pop it out so that you're viewing it in the full screen and not, um, not within your OMS context. So there, there are a lot of options that you can use for doing, for doing that. I do, before I kind of pop to Q&A, want to um, let you know a little bit about help with OMS. So in the university libraries, we have a digital research and scholarship services team. This is a cross departmental team that has folks who can help you honestly with all sorts of research needs that you may have. OMS is one of the tools that we support though, and we can help you figure out the best way um, for you to use the tool. We can provide you with further, more detailed training. Um, the OMS website though is actually really helpful and has a really helpful Google group. Um, phrases that you usually don't hear are really helpful Google group. Um, it will help you find the information, um, find how to's, find detailed, uh, you know, step by step details of who's done what, things that are in development, things that are being um, created. And then finally, I mean, honestly, I have been using OWN since it was in beta testing. Um, the University of Kentucky was kind enough, kind enough to let us be one of the initial testers um, for the OWN's tool. And so um, we've kind of figured out some tips and tricks and easy ways around some common challenges that might pop up with this. Um, I'm happy to, to just receive an email and to talk to you about what can be done, what can't be done. Um, and honestly, in some ways, ways you can get around uh, things. But, you know, for now, I'll stop the screen share and just pop back into the, oh, hey, Linda Kellum, I just saw that your name is in there. Um, sorry, uh, <laughs> but uh, I uh, will pop back out and, uh, go through questions before we hit the 30 minute mark. So there was a question about what if my transcripts have time codes written into them? Um, you actually, OMS, OMS will not automatically recognize that something is a time code because again, we're stripping all of the metadata that might exist, which honestly, even Word is just gonna recognize your time codes as a number just like any other number. So um, you can ingest a text file with the timestamps in it. It's just not going to um, automatically recognize that that's what the timestamps are. But if you do have that in there, what you can do is when you go to the syncing uh, screen, you don't necessarily, I mean, as you kind of saw, you don't have to listen to the full interview. You can click down and it automatically will go one minute for the first word that you click, two minutes for the second word that you click. And so you can just click in your transcript the next word after your minute mark that's in the transcript that already exists to make the syncing easier. Or you can kind of do what you said and strip them out. I would, because I think it's, you know, easier. I think it's less confusing for someone to see the minute mark marked twice than it is to for you to have to listen to the whole thing and put where those minute marks would be um, from scratch. I would just say, you know, make it all a text file, ingest it as is, go through the sync option and mark the next word at whatever you, whatever you already have as the two minute mark, mark that as the two minute mark and go forward with that. Does that make sense? You know how to find me too. So uh, I'm happy to, to answer additional, you know, questions or if you have, um, yeah, you can also do what Joe mentions and just keep the original transcript with the timestamps open in another window or, you know, if you own a printer, um, you know, print out a copy and have it on hand. Um, and go off of off of that if you don't want um, if you don't want those words kind of showing up. I will say so. What we do with our transcripts, we have some legacy transcripts. To be honest, for oral history interviews that were done in the past, 
and um, they didn't have timestamps in them, but they did have page numbers and they did have headers or footers um, and some information at the beginning of the text file that just basically said like interview, a lot of that metadata we saw at the beginning, interviewer, interviewee, interview date, interview place. We went in and we, we actually have stripped those out before turning the transcript into a text file. It's easy to strip headers and footers out of a Word document. Um, but uh, that's that's how we're dealing with that. You you can ingest it and it'll show up and you can just ignore it. But we typically just strip those out of the files. But we typically didn't have timestamps on any of our transcripts or any of our legacy transcripts. Are there any other questions? Linda owns a printer, so. Everyone can drive. Yeah, go, <laughs> go get that printer action from Linda. Um, okay, well, as people are thinking of their final questions, I will put some um, reminders in the chat. Our next one, next webinar coming up for the um, this series on research and application is on October 27th at 1 p.m on is this a quality journal to publish in? How can you tell um, by Anna Craft, our coordinator of metadata services? And um, this is gonna talk about um, making sure that you're also not um, kind of falling into that predatory uh, uh, publishing, what I would say trap, if that's the right way of saying it. <laughs> and then the next, we also have another series called Online Learning and Innovation, where actually Erin is next up on that one. So next week on Thursday, September 24th at 11 a.m., Erin uh, will be talking about digital storytelling tools at Night Labs with Northwestern. Um, and that is a uh, digital, our digital storytelling tools. I, I love, me some night lab so that will be a good one i think we have a lot of signups for that one already um awesome. our two separate sign up forms one um i'll drop both of the pages in the chat um but again they're the same deal 30 minutes recorded um yeah sorry what were you gonna say aaron no that's awesome i'm glad people are signed up they are um and then here's the research and application one. Um, again, hopefully, so we send out the link to the Zoom meeting, usually the morning of, uh, just so you have it fresh in your inbox. And uh, so be on the lookout for that if you sign up. You will also get a link to an assessment um, for this in the email with the recording. Um, so feel free to, uh, or please fill that out and let us know what you thought, if you have suggestions for other webinars um, and things of that nature. So um, you can probably hear my uh, my five-year-old's uh, computer in the background. She's in virtual kindergarten. So uh, just that's what's going on there. So yeah, so I think people are saying thank you. So are there any final questions for Erin as we uh, wrap this up? Wow, perfect timing. It's one. And I'll say too on a related, on a related note, um, in addition to questions about ohms, if anybody else is working on an oral history project or any kind of project that involves these types of interviews where the interviews themselves can be made accessible, I'm happy to, to talk with you more about, um, you know, I know oral history is one of those things that tends to be often thought of as the, the realm of the historians, um, and it's not. A lot of people are doing interviews in a lot of places, and these are interviews that have lots of secondary value beyond kind of for one person's project. And so I'm happy to talk at any point about, about how, how you might be able to kind of think about your, your project as, as a source for, for other people to do other things with it. Yes, like documentary filmmakers. I was gonna say, I have a quick question if it's not to, it's 1.30, but. <laughs> um, so this is for like oral histories primarily, but I could see this also being used maybe overkill to use it um, for like recorded webinars or like um, like if you're doing like conference proceedings. Do you see like that being useful for that too? Oh yeah, um, one of my favorite uses and for some reason 
their databases weren't working properly this morning. Um, Duke actually has a series of documentary films that were filmed by a man named Lee Waters in the 30s. And it's, you know, all of the film, all of the films from, from then, we have some of campus too, are, you know, one long recording. Um, and they actually use ohms to kind of chunk that up so that when you're looking at the one long film about Greensboro, it chunks it up as this is the segment where they're talking about cone or where they're showing cone mills. It, there's no sound. So, um, you know, this is the segment where they're showing this high school. It's a, you know, there are some folks doing, using these tools in, in creative ways that go well beyond basic kind of interview, interviewer, interviewee. And, um, you know, I'll be honest, the, the folks at Kentucky get really jazzed when people use it for, for new and exciting ways. And so I think they would be really interested in um, thinking about kind of conference recordings being presented out this way um, or any other creative uses. It's one of those things where you develop a tool as an oral historian. This is literally people who do oral history and oral history only as their thing. Um, and it, it's, it gets hard sometimes to think about other uses outside of your own for tools like this, um, even when you release your baby out into the world. And so I think, um, I think they're, they're open for people using it for whatever purposes work best for them. Okay, thank you, Joe, for that great question. So are there any other final questions for Aaron? Okay, well, I'm gonna take that as a no. Um, someone asked for your email, Aaron. Uh, do you wanna drop that? In the yeah. Chat? Okay, good, I typed it right. Last time someone did that, I typed my e own email address incorrectly. So that is the correct one. So there's, so I'm just gonna give everyone a second if they want to grab Erin's email. Um, but she's also CC'd on the email that y'all got this morning with the information for this webinar. And Sam knows how to find me, so you can- I do, you can also write me. I promise you I will direct you to the correct Erin. And uh, yeah, that's it. So at 1.35-ish, 34-ish, um, thank you all for coming. Again, remember there's other webinars coming up throughout the whole semester. Um, we do this every semester, so um, also be on the lookout for the next lineup in the spring. And feel free to email me um, or Erin with any questions about this series or this um, tool. Either one. Okay, well, thanks guys. I'm gonna end the meeting. I can hear my uh, five-year-old coming back upstairs. So see you all, bye. Thank you. <laughs>